Hi, my name is Anne McElhenney. And I'm Philip McAleer. And welcome to the Anne and Philip Scoop. It's week 104. That's actually two years. It's two years since the two... It's two, it's two years since the two weeks to flatten the curve. I actually cannot believe we're saying that. You know what I can say, I think, by the way? Has the curve been flattened? No. Oh, I think the curve is well flattened. But by the way, even though the curve has been well flattened, they're still at it. They're oh, yeah. still at the In kind what of... Way? Well, we have an example later on of yes, what happened that's at the true. Theater, Oh, yeah, right? no, they're, they're determined to kick the crap out of us, you know, just to remind us who they are. But, but by the way, I just want to say, you know, we've moved on from COVID now. We're now in the Ukraine, and there's a lot of pressure for a no-fly zone for the Ukrainians. For just two weeks, right? Well, I, I'm saying, don't worry, it's only going to last two weeks. The government has assured us it's going to be very temporary, and there will be no, um, and it'll end there. It'll just be a no-fly zone because the two week to flatten the curve lockdown that ended there. But didn't they didn't bring in things like uh, compulsory vaccinations for kids or uh, passports or, or vaccine passports to get into a toilet? To get into a toilet or into well, a not shop. a toilet actually. That's a bad example. You but know, to get indoors actually. Indoors? No, they didn't bring. Oh, yes, they did. They actually. You, they used. They went there. They used. The, we're all in this together. Just this Ukraine thing is we're all in this together, and give us power to do things, and we won't abuse it, and then they abuse it. So. Uh, just because if, uh, I know that there's terrible pictures coming out of the Ukraine and the emotional response is to give the government as much power as they're asking for. Just be careful about that uh, two week no fly zone uh, because and also uh, COVID, uh, Vladimir Putin may be a bit nastier than COVID ever was. He may he may have a he may end up having a higher death toll. Um, mm. So later we're going to speak to Miranda Devine, our dear friend Miranda Devine, um, who talks who will talk to us about all things Hunter and the Ukraine, talking of the Ukraine. And I'd have to say, you know, two years later, um, there's no pleasure here, by the way, on this podcast with being right about everything. Yeah. But oh my God, I mean, were we right about everything? Um, and we have an awful sad story about to say about that. About children and education and, yeah. and that. So Kamala Harris went to Europe and uh, what a joke. And uh, it's Yikes. Yikes. Who, yeah. said, who said 25th Amendment? You know, but anyway, yes. we're going to come to that. And we have a grim anniversary. This week yes. is the, the anniversary of the beginning of the Gosnell trial. We'll yes. bring you some thoughts from that. And we review a play about free speech that is currently um, staged, being staged in L.A. Yeah, yeah, free speech. Imagine that. A, a, a analysis of a, a play that really tackles free speech. You can re- I mean, that must be amazing. Mm. Mm. Okay. And we have a terribly tragic story from our crazy California section. Um, Very, very sad story. And, of course, you'll notice. (laughs) (laughs) If you're Irish, get into into the the parlor. parlor. There's There's a welcome welcome there for you. you. And And if if your name is O'Flaherty or Pat, Pat, as long as you're from Ireland, Ireland, there's there's a welcome on the map. map. So it's St. Patrick's Day. So we decided to... um, mine our wardrobes to find anything that we could wear that would be green and i think we've done well <laughs> i've got almost the 40 shades going on here some version of that 40 shades of lime this is oh really oh no but lime is on the is in the green family i think that's fair to say right i mean no one would say that lime wasn't green like the skin of a lime right okay moving on all right we're going to go over right now town looks the same no uh, we're going to go over right now to our interview. We spoke to Miranda Devine just a few moments ago, yes. and we're going to bring that interview to you Let's now. Let's go to Miranda right now. So we're joined now by our very good friend, Miranda Devine, uh, New York Post columnist, uh, journalist extraordinaire, author of The, the Laptop, Laptop from, from Hell, Hell mm-hmm. uh, Hunter Biden. And, uh, is, that, uh, is there a subtitle to it, H- Laptop from Hell? Yeah, it's very long. Hunter Biden being taken the dirty secrets the president tried to hide. Welcome, welcome, Miranda. Welcome <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. It's lovely to be with you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just say before we start that I always want to remind people of how we met Miranda first when we flew in. It was one of those things, one of those kind of perfect moments in life that I will never forget. You know, it's a long time ago and we flew into Sydney and arrive and we're like at the airport and, and we, get, I don't know, pick up a copy of the Sydney Morning Herald only to find a column devoted to saying how fabulous we were. And I just thought... <laughs> written, by this, written by this obscure journalist called Miranda, Miranda Devine. Devine. We'd never heard of her. I think, I think her career really took off. After, after, that, after that. That's right. That's right. Right. Oh yeah, I, everything that's correct. Before yes. and after that column. But I remember it was one of those, it was one of those kind of, you know, perfect days and it was very beautiful and we always and remember fast, you for fast that. Fast forward, we were in Fox 
in the Fox News headquarters. Oh, so just and, to make the Mark point, Stein. so just to make the point, we didn't meet her when we were in Australia. That's right. And then Mr. Mark Stein, we were standing there with Mr. Mark Stein recently, uh, a few years ago, and he goes, "Do you know Miranda Devine?" <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, we know. And he said, "Well, why don't we? Why don't we all meet up?" Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. On to the on to the subject in hand, Miranda. Um, you may have noticed there's a few stories coming out of the Ukraine at the moment. Um, huh. uh, you know, you but you've been writing and talking about the Ukraine for years. Why? Well, because the laptop from hell, um, a lot of it has the dirty secrets that Joe Biden tried to hide about his family's business in Ukraine when he was vice president and the millions of dollars that his son Hunter was paid by a corrupt uh, Ukrainian energy company called Burisma. And in fact, uh, in October of 2020, just three weeks before the election, um, uh, the New York Post, we ran a series of articles uh, containing emails that were in that laptop. And uh, one of them showed that Joe Biden had met um, his son Hunter's paymaster in Burisma, this Ukrainian uh, guy called Vadim Pozarsky. He'd met him in Washington, D.C. We ran an email uh, in which Vadim thanked Hunter profusely for introducing him to his father in Washington. Uh, and Joe was vice president then. So that story was such a bombshell that within um, a couple of hours of it being published, it was censored by big tech. Facebook and Twitter um, you know, stopped us being able to disseminate it. Um, they banned people from Twitter who tried to, um, you know, share it with people, even in direct message, in, in privately, someone like Kayleigh McEnany, for instance, who was President Trump's press secretary at the time. And so it was obviously dynamite material, which strangely, since then, uh, no one in, else in the media has really been interested in looking at. And what it shows is that when Joe was vice president, his son and his son's friend, Devin Archer, uh, went on to the board of Burisma, this corrupt energy company, um, at, at a time when Joe Biden was uh, in charge of that part of the world and was flying backwards and forwards to Kiev, lecturing the people of Ukraine about corruption. Mm. Uh, there were people in the State Department, mid-level people, who tried to sound the alarm. They, um, two of them, actually went to Joe Biden personally uh, once in his uh, office in, in uh, the White House and once on Air Force Two, in fact, when they were flying into Kiev, to say to him, look, there's a lot of chatter that we're picking up uh, and the Russians are using as propaganda uh, and Ukrainian oligarchs yeah. are talking about the fact that Hunter is on the board of Burisma and making a lot of money and it really causes uh, us a problem when we're trying to send yeah. the message yeah. to yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Can I just say, I mean, if there's ever you want an example of 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 the of the, the, the death of journalism, right? Let mm -hmm. let's just say that they they, yeah. they didn't really understand what they were doing back then. But U Ukraine is the biggest story on the planet at the right moment. Now. It's 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 one of the biggest stories in in in, in decade in a decade. Wouldn't shouldn't the reporters be saying it's very interesting because the president of the United States has a particular interest in the Ukraine and his son. Ha There's no one's mentioning that. No one's mentioning about Biden leveraging his contacts, about Hunter Biden leveraging his contacts, you know, to try and work out what's going on in the Ukraine. There's nothing. It's like it's like yeah. years. Ago. It's like this this previous life with the Ukraine. Yeah. The Biden's never existed. Well, and even worse, Joe Biden actually threatening Ukraine that he would withhold a billion dollars worth of American say, aid yes. uh, unless they fired the prosecutor, a guy called Poroshenko. Let's just, let's just play that tip. Let's actually. play that tip yeah. right now. I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to the press conference. Said, "No, nah, I said I'm not going to. Or, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." 
I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid. I was funny. I was going to mention that to you. I mean, you know, can you just imagine if Donald Trump, you, you substitute Donald Trump for, for Joe Biden in that in that clip? I think we'd be seeing that clip everywhere on every news show every night. And we're not seeing that clip at all. No. And look, the fact that Joe Biden boasted about doing that. Um, is really curious. I, I've often wondered why he did that. I mean, he he, he is a, a you know compulsive boaster, uh, always trying to pump his himself up. But maybe I also have wondered if he was trying to sort of cover up his tracks by coming clean, uh, yeah. so that no one would doubt him. And in fact, that that uh, it's mo kind of works with the likes of the New York Times, um, and so he. Uh, threatened aid, and yet guess who, which president was actually impeached for um, trying to get to the bottom of, of this story about the Bidens in yeah. Ukraine? Um, that was Donald Trump for calling President Zelensky and saying to him, hey, you know, could you look into this Biden thing? That was so threatening to the regime that they had him impeached to the yeah. Democratic Party. They didn't want anyone sniffing around and finding out what was really going on in Ukraine. And look, I know chapter and verse what the Bidens got up to, but uh, I mean, also there's been a lot of reporting about what the Clintons and the Clinton Foundation got up to. Ukraine had been a piggy bank and a playground for a lot of wrongdoers uh, in, in American power elites um, for many years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but I mean, the Bidens, they they really took the cake and the yeah, fact so, that i mean just just to let people just to remind people yeah. our movie my son hunter uh, yes. will feature the ukraine rather heavily yes. um uh, we, we filmed it in serbia for that very reason so that serbia could double as ukraine because it really was as you say the piggy bank for hunter biden's life and lifestyle yeah. for i mean he he lives he lives i mean there are medieval princes <laughs> who would be so envious at Hunter Biden's lifestyle. I mean, he had a, a, a $10 million house on the Venice canals. He's up in Malibu now. He, he jet set it from, from the Chateau Marmont to the peninsula to but somewhere you know, in New York. I know, but I want to ask Miranda. But my, that, MySonHunter.com. MySonHunter.com. Yes. But I want to ask Miranda. I mean, you know, maybe you're being very unfair here, Miranda. I mean, you know, maybe, you know, and maybe you should explain to people that your Hunter was probably amply qualified to be on the board of an energy company in ukraine i mean talk to talk to us about this highly intelligent young smartest young, person smartest joe, person joe that, biden's ever met the united states has ever met um i think you might be tell uh, explain why uh, we don't think that you're being unfair miranda defend yourself miranda. Yes, defend yourself now <laughs> Well, look, Hunter was not qualified for uh, anything to do with uh, going on the Burisma board. He didn't know anything about Ukraine. He knew nothing about energy. I mean, he admitted that in an ABC interview. Uh, he doesn't speak Ukrainian. Um, he, his sole uh, uh, kind of qualification was that he was the son of Joe Biden. And uh, as we all know, uh, in these countries, including in China, you don't give the bribe to the important official, you give the bribe to a family member. Uh, in China, this happened, um, and in fact, in China, there's a name for them, they're called princelings. And that's what Hunter Biden was. Hunter Biden was uh, a crackhead. He had a degenerate lifestyle. He could barely get out of bed in the morning. Um, he, he, you know, he, he, it, it was all he could do to pour himself onto a plane and get to Monte Carlo or Paris or some other wonderful place to stay in a, a magnificent hotel to go to the Burisma board meeting. And even then, uh, he writes in his own memoir that he, uh, you know, was in Monte Carlo and somehow a cracker crack dealer found him and he ended up going on a bender. Um, you know, the guy was not capable of holding down a job at McDonald's, let alone a high powered international business career. And, uh, you know, the, the problem that we find ourselves in now is that we have a president who we don't know how compromised he is in his relationships with uh, Ukraine, with Russia, 
uh, you know, we know that um, Nikolai Zlachevsky, who was the owner of that corrupt energy company, Burisma, um, was, uh, you know, a, an oligarch uh, aligned with Vladimir Putin and, and the Russians. And um, he had had his bank accounts frozen in London um, uh, at the time that Hunter and his friend Devon Archer went onto the board uh, because there was an international investigation into his ill-gotten gains. Now, that was explicitly explained to Hunter in emails from this guy, Vadim, who met uh, Joe in, uh, in Washington, that they wanted uh, Hunter to use his connections in Washington, D.C. to get the, um, the, the FBI, to get Interpol off Zlochevsky's back to stop them from investigating Burisma. And that worked. Uh, a bribe was paid uh, in Ukraine and, and that managed to, to get Slachevsky off those international charges, but that didn't stop um, the Ukrainian prosecutor uh, from continuing his own investigation. And at the very time that Joe Biden fired him, he had just, or got, sorry, he, Joe Biden didn't fire him. Joe Biden got the president of Ukraine to fire him or to get him to resign. But at that very moment, he had just, uh, seized a whole lot of um, property that had belonged to the Burisma owner in Kiev. And that was, you know, mansions and uh, a Rolls Royce and some plots of land. So that was an active investigation. And uh, the prosecutor, Viktor Shokin, also has told Ukrainian newspapers since that he um, was intending to subpoena Hunter Biden and Devin Archer. So it was really an emergency for Joe Biden. And you can tell that the urgency, uh, uncharacteristic urgency really for Joe Biden, who's very relaxed about everything, um, is uh, it was that it, it's a flurry of phone calls went on between him and the president of Ukraine, Poroshenko, um, at that time. Uh, and uh, we know the contents of some of those phone calls because they were leaked. So there's just a web of evidence to show that Joe Biden was up to no good um, in Ukraine, that he was using his influence to make money for his son. And, um, and, and no one's shown any curiosity about that now. And I think it's important, uh, especially when, you know, people are, are trying to pressure America into wading into this hot war in Ukraine. So um, how does it feel, you know, with all these uh, Ukraine experts emerging in the media? Oh, when, you know, you, they've been ignoring and suppressing this story for years, right? And suddenly they're they're there, and you know they're on TV, and they're they're really they they know they know they know the Ukraine as as intimately as they knew COVID, uh, you know. <laughs> but that's a worry already. Yeah, but you know, good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you've been talking. You you know you you're one of those people. They kind of go, oh, Miranda banging on about the Ukraine again, and then suddenly they're yeah. the people who are the experts yeah. on the Ukraine. Has have they been phoning you up looking for the background, Miranda? You know, have your has your phone been ringing off the hook? Well, isn't that interesting? You see the same cast of characters now popping up on TV as Ukrainian experts who were were testifying against Donald Trump in his first impeachment over that Ukrainian phone call. And, um, you know, these people knew full well what the Bidens were up to in Ukraine at the time. They never spoke up. Now, uh, here they are just pretending that none of that background exists. And, uh, you know, the other cast of characters that we're hearing from uh, are some of the 50 odd um, sort of intelligence and defence uh, former, uh, you know, operatives, uh, people like Leon Panetta, Michael yeah. Hayden, James Clapper, John Brennan, who organised this letter that these people wrote uh, after the New York Post story came out. Um, just in time to help uh, Joe Biden in his uh, last debate against Donald Trump. And this letter said that the um, stories that we were running, that Hunter Biden's laptop had all the hallmarks okay. of Russian disinformation. Mm -hmm. So when I see these people now talking about Russian disinformation, it really has lost its uh, gravitas, lost its sting because they misused it uh, and 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 politicized that phrase uh, with Ukraine, um, with the laptop, but also, of course, for anyone with a longer memory uh, than a goldfish, uh, during the whole Hillary Clinton 
uh, Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, uh, pretending that somehow Donald Trump was an agent of the Kremlin. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, they're, they're, everyone's wondering why, why does no one believe the mainstream media or the corporate media? Anymore? Yeah. And it's like, it's because you've been, you know, you've been caught again, again and again. You pushed the Russia hoax when it was obvious there was nothing there. You you ignored you ignored you suppressed the Hunter Biden Ukrainian uh, the Hunter Biden laptop story. You put out a, a an official sounding letter to help a mm. political friend, calling this you know, as you say, all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. And now they're saying, well, that may not have been Russian disinformation, but this definitely is. And we're going, we don't believe you anymore. anymore yeah. yeah, it's so corrosive because, I mean, maybe there there is Russian disinformation yes. that we now are trusting yes. because we don't trust the, the very intelligence people who, yep. uh, you know, we pay, who we, uh, I guess, trusted previously yeah. and and were found i mean during the iraq war i trusted uh you know to my great discredit i trusted what we were being told about weapons of mass destruction and i think uh you know that that what happened in iraq is um so fresh in people's memories that yeah. uh, they don't really trust any of the sort of war propaganda that's coming out and that's um that's that's really terrible for the kind of cohesiveness of a country if you're going in, into times of peril with a very weak president well, exactly times of peril and times of, times of peril and times of disinformation and suddenly mm. you you do not trust the people who are telling you this is disinformation um uh so and you know it, it's they've they've they, you know they've been hoist by their own petard uh Totally. I love that. Hoist by your own yeah. No idea what it means, but it sounds good, though. I sounds it, painful, I, by the way. Very one Shakespearean. Of my, one of my best... Uh, this is a long story, perhaps don't, too long. No, it was, um, Tangent. It was a, It was a <laughs> Romanian uh, gymnast who was... Oh, who was fine. Nadia. No, no, no. It was fine with a oh, small... she was my favourite. Small, small, small amount of, 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 of drugs in her system. A tiny little bit. Tiny anyway, little bit. Leon, uh, Jan Syriac, who was the head of the Romanian Olympic Committee, if he had to ban her for life. And it turns out it was him that had pushed for the law. Uh, and, oh. he was, and I said he was hoist by his own leotard. <laughs> oh, that's okay. All right. Actually, that wasn't that long. And it's not a bad... That's very punchline. good. It's not a bad yeah. punchline. I think one thing for just to remind people again, I think um, to remind people how nice it was for Hunter Biden to have that job at Burisma. How much did they pay him and for how long? They paid him $83,333 a month um, until his father no longer was vice president, at which time they cut his pay in half. But all up, he got about $4 million. Uh, from Burisma and, uh, you know, uh, lots of other little um, payoffs because he helped, you know, he, he tried to get Burisma involved with a whole lot of Chinese deals. Um, and, you know, he got these uh, fabulous flights into wonderful places like Monte Carlo and yes. was wined and dined. And um, he went off to the Norwegian fishing shack of uh, Mikolai Slachevsky, the owner of Burisma. And I'm sure so that's a he, modest little building. Oh, I'm sure it's very modest. Yeah, <laughs> yes. we, love, we love going to stay in those modest dwellings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, hopefully well, it will happen someday. But um, yeah, I mean, he, so he, he's lived a life. I mean, he lived a fantastic life. And as you say, in his own book, you know, which uh, it's really great to reference his own book because you remember that during this period, this five years when he was getting this fabulous money, he says that he smoked crack cocaine every 20 minutes. And I don't know much about the world of business or corporate business <laughs> or being on a board, but I, I, I would hazard a guess that the people on the board might notice now if you'd be smoking those, tw you know, every 20 minutes. And then the other thing that I loved was the other detail was that when he was sitting at the Chateau Marmont pool, he would rack up a bill of, I think it was $700 in an afternoon, not buying anyone a drink and I know I've been to a few posh hotels I mean really the most expensive cocktail you could have would be maybe maybe fifty dollars right and even at that yeah. you don't see that often so he was and he was saying like the barman would literally be looking at him kind of admiringly saying god you're still walking right so that's four, <laughs> 14 cocktails so at least right 14 cocktails sitting at the pool but also smoking the crack cocaine so what's in a cocktail and giving uh, by the way and I love the detail by the way and giving because very important to know what he was bringing um 
you know, that his, his particular skill set apparently for Burisma was corporate governance. Am I right about that? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so a cocktail. Just a, a cocktail always includes two alcoholic beverages. Is that the, ne- no, the definition? No, I don't believe that's the. Ne- no, so you no. can have a cocktail one with one. It could alcohol- be like a tequila and some lime juice. I'm oh, okay. off the drink, by the way, for Lent, Miranda. Oh, you good girl. Oh, this is why. I, this is why I'm talking about it, just to torture her. I swear, I swear <laughs> my soul is going to be pristine after this. Um, but it's good every now and again to check in that you don't have a drink problem. But, but yes, that, yes. You don't need two. But by oh. the way, it's very pleasant if you do have two alcoholic beverages within the cocktail. So that's at least 14 uh, units. Alcohol, shots, units units. Alcohol, shots yes. but probably 20. Correct. And then the crack cocaine. I mean, he has an extraordinary constitution. And by the way, the notion that he that he met, I, I mean, I love that detail as well, where he met the girl. I mean, you know all this. Met the girl at the pool, you know, what? met the, you know, the one he's married to right. now. Married yes. six days later. But I love the thing that within a few minutes of their first conversation, and in fairness, feel a bit of love at first sight with ourselves here now, to be honest with you. But either way, still wasn't six days now that we got married in. But the thing where he said to her, you know, well, I'm a bit of an alcoholic, or I'm a drug addict. And she went, that's all over now. And I was thinking, isn't it lovely now that she has that magical formula? They could sell that, by the way. Yeah, she could sell right. that. She could make a fortune. Well, her and Annabella Shiora uh, should get together. Oh, Annabella, indeed. Yeah, she, she took was, the herbal mix. Did no, she? she she was a uh, Harvey Weinstein apparently made her a drug addict. Uh, she was so traumatized, but she, uh, she she said this in a New York courtroom that she had managed to kick her drug habit using uh, items that she'd bought in CVS. You see, look at CVS there. You know, amazing. That that's why all the drug addicts are robbing CVS. So that, they're looking for the, looking for the Annabella <laughs> Shiora. That's the reason. We're coming to the end of the interview. What are you going to do for St. Patrick's Day, Miranda? As long as you're from Ireland, oh, there's so a welcome on, on the mat. mat. Okay, go on. I don't hadn't thought of that. Maybe we'll go to one of New York's marvelous Irish pubs. Yes, you do notice that we dressed for the occasion. <laughs> yes, marvelous. We had to we had to do a lot of deep dive in the wardrobes to try and find something green. Yes, funny how often you <laughs> find you don't have any a green outfit. But yes. look at me, thank you. Compliments. Oh, I missed the I missed the opportunity. I should have worn my green jacket. There you yes. go. Well, it's, we're, we're early taping this, obviously, before St. Patrick's Day. But anyway, um, do you have any more questions for Miranda Phelan? I suppose if there was two or three points that, that every American should know about Hunter Biden and Ukraine, you know, just give us three fast fun facts. Fun facts. As, say, facts. as yeah, you guys it. say in the media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just put me on the spot. Look, um, Hunter Biden was living like an oligarch. I mean, he was mixing with the oligarchs in Lake Como and uh, Monte Carlo, Shanghai. Uh, so it's interesting seeing um, the, the um, Department of Justice now uh, being ordered by Joe Biden to go and um, sanction all these oligarchs and yeah. seize their yachts and, yeah. and their ma- ill-gotten gains. I think uh, Joe Biden called them in his State of the Union address. Well, yeah. his son partook of those ill-gotten gains, so maybe he should just ask Hunter for some uh, assistance there. Yeah, where are um, they? Yeah. yeah. And, and look, when it comes to Ukraine... Uh, we don't know if Joe Biden is compromised, but there is so much evidence that he could be. And, you know, he should come clean and he should be asked questions about it. Because if we're going to be committing, uh, you know, well, at the moment, uh, lots of money, but um, ultimately, if uh, this is going to end up endangering American lives, um, we need to know what exactly we've got ourselves into yes. and um, whether or not the president is making rational decisions or, or decisions that might somehow be compromised by his family's involvement. Um, and I don't think that is too hyperbolic to say. I think, uh, you know, it's careful and prudent to say that. I don't think I'm overstating the case. Um, and thirdly, I mean, China obviously is the, you know, the elephant in the room always. And uh, this is where the Bidens really hit pay dirt. Um, and, uh, and, and where, I mean, they're... Joe Biden is definitely compromised with President Xi. And you've noticed that his tone about President Xi since he became president, um, you know, at the beginning he was saying, oh, you know, we're really good friends. And then after a few months he's saying, oh, no, no, we're not friends. It's all business. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, whatever that relationship is, he's boasted about it previously. And, I mean, we all know that Joe Biden's not a genius uh, and that uh, President Xi, in his, in his, by Joe Biden's own uh, boast, has spent 
many hours with um, Joe Biden one-on-one. So he's sized up the man, just like Vladimir Putin did. He uh, knows that he's not a threat. He knows that America is weak with this president at the helm. So uh, I, I don't think that the times of peril are over, even if somehow this uh, Ukrainian mess gets sorted out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Miranda. It's, it's uh, you know, if the media was doing its job, uh, we'd know oh. a lot more and uh, we'd, we'd be, you know, it, it'd just be nice to believe the media because I, I believe me, it doesn't, I don't feel good about uh, being skeptical, uh, you know. No. And generally, generally you can, you can believe everything bad about Vladimir Putin, but it's just the messenger is so discredited now that yes. I find myself in the awkward position of trying to see if, Vladimir Putin is really as bad as people say he is. And it's like, it's not a comfortable position to be in, but it's their fault. It's the media's fault because they they have just they've lied about everything. They've just misused yes. the word Russian disinformation. So I have to, you have to really dig deep now to try and find what the, the truth. truth is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so true. It's really tragic. And look, I think it, it, if, if somebody managed to fix the New York Times, for instance, uh, you know, that one paper has such an inordinate influence on the rest of the media. Everyone follows the agenda it sets. Um, you know, even, I mean, dare I say, conservative media. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, if you somehow manage to, to get hold of the New York Times and, yeah. and, crush the corruption it is a corrupted newspaper mm-hmm. um uh, you know the 1619 project for instance was championed by the owner uh, the young Sulzberger. so uh you know that that was a destructive thing in itself so i, I don't know that if i if i had to wave my magic magic wand and do one thing it would be uh and i had i had gazillions of dollars i would buy the new york times yeah. Maybe Elon Musk might buy it. Yes, right. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yes. Yes. Hint, hint, Elon. Yes. There yes. you go, Elon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Miranda. Pleasure. Have a very great St. Patrick's Day. Happy um, St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, I hope yes. we get to see you, by the way, before too long. For sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All the best. Bye. There you go. So I think the lesson from that is um, don't listen to the journalists who are now the Ukrainian experts and buy Miranda Devine's book, yes. Laptop from Hell. And you can get it everywhere where you can get books available oh we should actually mention Anne, that you uh, given the day that's in it or the week that's in it that you will be uh showing people how to make an irish coffee why have you got two bottles of whiskey sitting over there because i'm going to explain to people about the kind of whiskey that you use when you're making an irish coffee and by the way you really don't want to use either of these because they're too nice yeah. You well, want to use a nice cheap one, but I mean, I'll go. I'll come to that at the end. Okay. So what else is on the show, Anne? Well, as I was saying, uh, you know, earlier, you know, it's it, there's no pleasure on this podcast about being right about everything to do with COVID. Uh, like absolutely zero pleasure, particularly mm-hmm. this story, which we talked about. You know, I would say pretty much every day when we had our daily podcast on the COVID. Yeah, we had. Remember, we had the Alan Film Scoop Daily Virus, and every day we talked about. You are destroying children's education. You're destroying their development. For what reward? Yes. For what? Yes. And have you done? And we and we constantly have you done an talk, analysis. Yeah. Of have it? we done an analysis? Have we done a cost benefit analysis in terms of of human development, of what you're going to lose if you put these masks on these children, if you keep these children at home? And now the New York uh, Times, you isolate them the from other children. The despicable New York Times is now starting to put in these articles. Like here's a headline from the New York Times this week. Um, Dana Goldstein. It's alarming. You know, children are severely behind in reading. You don't need to have ever it's gone. Not, by the way, you, let me uh, just finish the point. You don't have to ever have gone to college or know anything about anything to know that, of course, children are severely behind in everything because of what happened. How on earth is it alarming? It, it was obvious. That's right. It was obvious. Yeah. It, 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 it's the least alarming. I mean, it's awful. But the idea that alarm is a sudden outcry, oh, yeah. or, or oh, yeah. someone has discovered something, that was obvious from the from word go. From the first go. day. So, the kinder, so here's what they say in the New York Times. The kindergarten crisis of last year, when millions of five-year-olds spent months outside the classroom, has become this year's reading emergency. Shocker. Not even slightly shocking to anyone who has a brain by the way. Um, As the pandemic enters its third year, a cluster of new studies now show, a cluster, by the way, a lot, shows that about one third of children, one third of children in the youngest grades are missing reading benchmarks up significantly from before the pandemic. In Virginia, one study found early reading skills were at a 20 year low this fall, which the researchers described as 
alarming. Well, good for you, researchers. Yes. You were very quiet for the last couple of years, yeah. you researchers. And you were very quiet in the New York Times, not yeah. not reporting on, on a story that was as obvious to the ordinariest person that ever was born yeah. that this was going to happen. Uh, just horrible. In the Boston region, I just want to read a bit more of this. 60% of students at some high poverty schools have been identified as at high risk for reading problems. Twice the number of students as before the pandemic. And you know the worst thing about progressives for me? It's like that thing. I used to always make that joke with you, Philip. When somebody says, uh, it's for the children, you need to really grab your children yeah. and run. The minute anyone says that, grab your children and run. If anyone says it's for the children, because you can be guaranteed whatever it is that comes after that sentence is not at all for children. Yes. That's for sure. Whatever it is about anything, to do with anything, it's not going to be about children. Um, and here is a typical example of that. The progressives always say that they're all about, you know, minorities and the poor and all of that. No, actually, they don't care. They don't care at all, actually. And they proved it. Mm -hmm. Because, again, anyone with any sense at all would have known that, of course, poor people would be most affected educationally by all of this. If you're really rich, you can afford to get a tutor. You can afford to have maybe one, uh, if you're a couple, to have one of you not work and stay home with the kids. You can afford all of that. If yeah. you're poor, both of you are working, maybe work more than one job, very little time, home at night, exhausted. Delivering food, by the way, delivering food to the homes of these really rich people during COVID. Um, your children are actually going to have a problem. And maybe yeah. you didn't have internet and the children couldn't zoom in. And they got forgotten by all these teachers unions who say it's for the children and who couldn't care less about well, LA, the children. LA, USD still have masks on children. Yeah. So the most progressive ch school district in America where every other school district in America has taken masks off children, they're still examining the data, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the data's out. Uh, putting masks on children stops their development, stops their reading development, stops their speaking development, stops their development, full stop. And so, people who say they care about poverty, they care about people not, not falling into poverty, you know, the connection between a poor educational result, the, the connection between illiteracy and poverty, is, and the connection between illiteracy, poor education, and incarceration, and getting yourself into into all kinds of trouble is, you know, this is, everyone knows this forever. And these people, like, shame on you, like, shame on you. But it gets worse, by the way. It actually gets worse. Um, and this story we just talked about before we came on air, like, this is unbelievable, like, this story. Yeah. So the Centre for, the Centre for Good Disease Control, the CDC, um, like, this is just unbelievable. They've like, you changed the like standards. This, st so they have, have recently um, updated, updated their guidelines um, about about expectations for children's development mi milestones. They've updated, you know. They've oh, updated. updated. So that, updated that's after great, twenty um, years. Updated. That they've, updated. So they've, they've involved the latest. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know. First of all, two things. Go, go on, ahead. sorry. No, Phil. go ahead. I'm two just... things. One, first of all, the last time they updated their guidelines to look at milestones, developmental milestones for children, was twenty years ago, right? Suddenly now they needed to update these milestones urgently. And you know what they did with the milestones? They brought them down. They brought all the developmental uh, milestones down. So, for example, well, to course, give an I mean, example... I mean, of course they did, Lam, because it's not like that the children are going to be uh, going out into a world where being highly educated and highly developed is, is important to advance because, you know, you know, it's obviously there's so much manual labor out there. They're not, they're not entering a world of automation now, where manual labor uh, and uh, will will be um, be unimportant or anything. You know, I mean, no, no, no. Bring bring the milestones down. Go ahead. Shame on them. I mean, these are these are really bad people. These are really bad people who are trying to pretend that they are changing these educational developmental milestones. Just as a matter of course, they're and they're trying to get away with this without saying that this is the reason they're doing this, is so that when um, the research is done, there it does not indicate how awful they were during the lockdown to agree to the lockdown for children. Yes. So they're actually doing this intentionally, doing this to cover their asses and to try and get so what, away. So what's the new guideline? The now, the now you says... Know, 50, so the, the old guideline says... Uh, sorry, the, the guideline right now says 50 words that a child, a bit like a little one, 50 words by 30 months. You should know 50 words. You should know... That's what they're saying now. You should know 50 words by 30 months. However, the American Speech, Language and Hearing Association, ASHA, says that fewer than 50 words at 24 months 
should be a cause of concern. So, so basically, I mean, did you, you get that? So the CDC have actually now created a guideline and said, it's okay, you know, really, if you have 50 words by 30 months, you're doing, you're doing okay. However, the truth is, if you have only 50 words by 30 months th- yesterday, like, like yeah. the day before this new CDC guideline, the truth was that people would, that would have been a trigger warning. CDC are saying the children should know 50 words by 30 months that's what of they're age. Saying now. And if they know less than that, then that's a warning. But previously it was 50 words at 24 months was a cause of concern. Was already a However, cause of concern. both organizations have said that if those any of those 50 words are a uh, boy, young boy saying, I'm a woman, then that's a real sign of development and the parents should be given a medal. No, but no, I mean, no, no, Phelan. Uh, but, I'm, you know, the CDC also spent a lot of time saying that BLM protests were not a uh, cause for concern. Maybe it wasn't the CDC, but doctors spent a time saying BLM protests were not a cause for concern during the pandemic. When because so they said that racism was, uh, was racism, actually... Racism was, actually was worse. Was a the danger, CDC dangerous. also said that people should not be evicted. Anyway, to move on from that, I mean, it's a really horrible story. To move on from that, Kamala Harris, as you probably know, went to Europe um, and... Uh, I have to say, our our friend Roger Kimball, who we need to get back on the on the podcast again, who's really fabulous, wrote a really great piece for B- Spectator World. Well, in the Spectator, the U- U- the US Spectator, the US yeah. Spectator, and uh, it's really really good. Um, and it's the he- <coughs> excuse me, the headline is Kam- Kamala Harris laughs at war. The vice president's diplomatic jaunt acro- around Eastern Europe was an embarrassment. The piece uh, we'll put the piece up, and uh, everyone can read the whole thing. But it's kind of extraordinary. So you know, one of her first stops was Poland. God help the Polish. Right? Right. And she did a press uh, conference with the the president of Poland. And you cannot make this stuff up. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from that press conference from Kamala Harris. So there she was standing with the Polish president, um, Duda. And here's what she says. I am here, standing here on the northern flank, on the eastern flank talking about what we have in terms of the eastern flank and our NATO allies. And if you think that's bad... I am on the northern flank, do da, do da. I am on the northern Stop flank. Stop it. See, See here's like another... Andre, do da. If you like that one, if you like that one, here's another. Here's another moment from the press conference. Is this like, is this going to be like uh, JFK, like benign Berliner? I have to say, by the way, I think this could be a feature, a regular feature on the podcast. I can do a dramatic reading of the words of Kamala Harris. Here's another one. Kamala. We all watched the television coverage of just yesterday. Now, by the way, you have to listen to this very carefully, Phelan. And ve- Phelan is very, very intelligent. And when I'm finished, Phelan, being I'm Berlin. I want you to tell me what she said. What, right? what she means, what she means. What she was communicating. Uh-huh. We all watched the television coverage of just yesterday. Mm-hmm. That's on top of everything else that we know mm-hmm. and don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Based on what we've just been able to see and uh-huh. because we've seen it or not, doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but just limited to what we have seen. So I went to college, Philip, but I am not able to read that. So could you tell me? Can you <laughs> look, can you tell me that look, now? Um, Maybe I didn't go far enough in college. See, the problem is, Do you know the way they say that? Did you go far enough in college? Do you know I may not have gone far enough no, in college? No, the problem is, Anne, that you just don't have the subtlety and the progressive mindset to understand that and to appreciate that, right? Can I just because, say... And don't forget, Sarah, Pal- Sarah Palin was an idiot. Don't forget oh, that. Oh, apparently so. That's yes, right. Yes, So uh, f- Oh, exactly. You know what? That's a good one to remember, by the way. That's a really good one to remember. Yeah. Apparently, Sarah Palin was an idiot. Yes. And we, go, we never heard the end of it. But listen to this. Then Kamala moved on to Romania. And to another presser, this time with the Romanian president, Klaus Ioannis. 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 A reporter said... Uh, but a reporter asked the question, how long should Americans expect? How long should we be bracing for this historic inflation and some unprecedented gas prices? Great question, right? Um, she then looked, by the way, it's very funny. And you can look at all this stuff. I mean, it's all online. She then looked, by the way, at the Romanian president, like hoping that he would, you know, bail, in, her, in, bail her out. Inter- intervene in intervene her. Intervene on her behalf on a story that was a question that was defla- asked to her. About American inflation. I think, so, I think the president of Romania has enough problems. Yeah, yeah. It was like, no, it's over to you there, Kamala. Sweetheart. So again, here we go. Here's Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States. The great white hope that was sent over there to sort things out, you know. I'm not sure she's a great, I terms, thought you're a great white hope. You know this. what I mean. I knew you'd pick me up on that one. <laughs> In terms of the uh, discussions that uh, President Giannis and I had 
They ranged in subject including the issue of the Black Sea and I'll let him explain in more detail as he would like. But as we are all again fully aware and appraised because we are in constant communication with the president, with his administration here, about the concerns that they have about the entire region and frankly, the vulnerability, all you have to do is look at the map. I get the impression she hadn't looked at the map before she went there. Do you know what I thought, by the way? Can I just tell you what I honestly thought here? And I mean, this tells you a lot about me and how superficial I am. I was thinking she went over there like, you know, on Air Force Two or One or whatever, right? Nice private plane and all that. And I think she literally hit the gin and tonics and she was like, maybe with her sister. You were saying that the sister is Kevin, is like the advisor. Yeah, she's and the, she said uh, to the sister, Lady Macbeth, isn't this great? I've never been to Poland before. She isn't this great? Crack? Romania. And we're going to Romania as well. Do you know what? I love another, do you know what? I'll have another gin and tonic. And do you know what? You can double up on the gin there. Now, I don't know if she's got a drink problem, but if it was me, I'll be problem. honest with you now. I'll be honest with you. If it was me on that plane, I would be doing massive amounts of homework because I'd be thinking, this is my moment for shining, right? This is my moment to be in this press conferences and look and tell people just how bright and intelligent I am and how well I understand the geopolitical situation with the borders and all of that, right? But I think she then thought, do you know what? And you know the way you would do that yourself? You wake up in the morning and you think, you know, I don't want to go to work. And she thought, you know what? But I'll just have a gin and tonic first. Can I, can I just confirm this, uh, this is um, how Anne McElhinney behaves on such planes? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. That's, do you remember when we went uh, with the oh, with the Romanian foreign oh God, minister? That is true. Actually, okay, that's true. We did we went go with the Romanian foreign minister to Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan and Moscow. Now, by the way, he was drinking, uh, so and I was only being polite. I remember that. I was I remember, being polite. I remember that. So, and the, then the worst no, part no, was no, the worst part. No, 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 was, no, 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 let's start with the let's start with the least worst part. <laughs> so everyone was very mature when the plane was on the ground. We were in sort of Romanian Air Force One or something like that. And it was grand. Plane, by the way, I was very excited. Everyone, but everyone was very mature. By the way, I'd been a journalist for about three weeks, and then the plane took off, and the whole demeanour of the plane changed. <laughs> like, and the booze just started flowing. Fabulous. Right? And then, and I think he was quite fond of me. He was quite fond of you. He's a bit of a smoothie, old, old. Uh, he had a little Mercer twinkle. Joanna, Mercer and he came Joanna. down and he sat beside, beside you me. across oh, the yeah. aisle. I said, "Would you like and to you... interview me now?" And I'm like. <laughs> so Anne, Anne, rather than Anne interviewing, Anne lectured him. Oh, I did. Oh, because he had been nice to somebody. I, I can't remember what there you lectured, so, him, but I lectured, but him, Anne about lectured his... him about this. Why is, why is Romania going to Uzbekistan lecturing people about human rights or something like that there? And then when he gave the press conference oh, yeah. in Uzbekistan, he sort of goes, now, many people have asked, why are Romania here lecturing <laughs> people about human rights? So you see, despite the alcohol, I still held my own. Is you that what you're your kind own. of saying? Uh, well, I'm just saying that, that yes, Anne McLean, that, that you would, uh, you know, uh, you may have thought Anne was joking there that when she gets on Air Force One or Air Force Two, she would hit the gin and tonics. I can confirm that did happen. I was young then. But I'm very, very mature now, as all of yes. you know, by the way. I want to finish this Kamala Harris section, Kamala Harris section, by just saying, and I, this, is, this is again quoting from, the, from this great piece from uh, Roger Kimmel. Um, he's, and he says, I'll read what he said. He said, some mean people, I think this is a brilliant point he makes, by the way. Some mean people uh, have been bringing up the 25th Amendment whenever Joe Biden's name is mentioned, and with good reason. But some of us wonder whether it might be preemptively applied to Kamala Harris. I understand there would be legal complications, but that's why God made lawyers to sort these things out. In any event, I have to wonder, and I think he's really on to something here. I think this is interesting. I have to wonder whether the powers that be, the puppet masters pulling Joe Biden's strings, did not send Kamala Harris to Eastern Europe to help burnish her image, but rather to humiliate her. Because they just threw her out there. She is completely ill-equipped to deal with this. And now we have the video. No, but hold on. <laughs> but even, even the most ill-equipped person can read a script. Oh, right? No, but I can't understand so why therefore, you do your I mean, homework uh, on the plane. Well, of course, I mean, the, 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 the people who... The, the, remember, all these people are leaving her administration, her, her office, and they're all saying she won't read briefing notes, she won't read scripts. Uh, she has a sister who tells her what she should say. She's too arrogant to, to read the prep. And, you know, I think... You know, when, uh, that's all right when you're going to talk about climate change in Scotland, uh, you know, a non-story, but a non-issue. Uh, but when you're going to deal with a war mm -hmm. uh, that is in Europe at the moment, as we speak, then, you know, 
you assume the person is going to read the briefing notes. I mean, f- from that thing about if you look at the map and it's really yeah. clear, <laughs> it looks like she just looked at a map of Europe. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, she's starting to believe. And she's course, starting I mean, to understand looking that. At, look, I mean, she's starting to understand that, Pol- that Poland have that if Ukraine falls to the Russians, that Poland will have the largest, longest border with Russia, with Russia, and that is cause for everyone to get really upset and you, really worried. Do you remember when we went to Romania first? Somebody said, "If you want to understand the problems of Eastern Europe, get a map from 19." 19- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. get a map from 1925 get yes. a map from 1945 and, and see, we did and we did and, and, we did, and they're in the wall on, on the wall, wall here and they're on the walls here in this house and you know you see i mean hungary lost two-thirds of its territory after 1918 you know that went to romania i mean uh moldova the russians great thing was you know what, what the british did in in ireland was planting uh British people, people uh, to create facts on their the ground. People, yeah, their yeah. people, and this is what the, this is what the Russians did. And the borders keep changing. And there are parts of Poland that used to be Ukrainian. There are parts of Romania that used to be Ukrainian. There are parts of Ukraine that used to be Romania. Uh, the, most of Hungary is gone. You know, there, it's a mess over there. And uh, you know, I think that Kamala has just looked at a map. Um, you should have looked at a map before this. So his last line. Can I just give you that last line? And I from Roger br- Kimball. From Roger. From Roger Kimball. From the Spectator, the American Spectator. She was so clearly, so painfully out of her depth that any charitable person had to look away as she cackled and meandered her way to mental paralysis. And let's look at a little tiny piece of video here. And this is like really awful. This is from Poland. This is from when she was with the president of Poland, where she was asked about uh, refugees. I mean, this is unconscionable, given... I mean, it is unconscionable. Listen to the cackling. Just, we'll give you a little bit of cackle. And I'm wondering what the United States is going to do more specifically to set up a permanent infrastructure. And relatedly, is the United States willing to make a specific allocation for Ukrainian refugees? And for President Duda, I wanted to know if you think, and if you asked the United States to specifically accept more refugees... Okay. <laughs> a friend in need is a friend indeed. <laughs> okay, I, I, I can first. Okay. okay. So I have to say it was great uh, to see Saturday Night Live make fun of her. Not. Not. It didn't happen. But, yeah, but so Sarah um, from the from the ridiculous to the sublime, I suppose, um, in a way here. So this week, by the way, is a very grim milestone. This is the uh, 11 years ago. or No, sorry, not 11 years ago. So 2013. Uh, 2013, March 18th. Nine years ago. Nine years ago um, Kermit Gosnell entered the courtroom in Philadelphia. Um, and... At that, t- you know, you know, you, as you all know, we we made the Gosnell film, we wrote the Gosnell book, um, and we have more things to say about Gosnell. So when we started working on the Gosnell book and the movie, when we started thinking about all of that and reading a lot about that, and and we're so painfully conscious of how little attention this story was getting from the press, uh, I read some pieces from the Kermit Gosnell grand jury. Um, and we, we taped them and filmed them and put them up on YouTube. And I think it's fitting. And particularly given what what's everyone is thinking about right now, the Supreme Court decision that's coming up, I think it's fitting mm-hmm. to maybe re- revisit them. Um, and so we're going to bring those two pieces to you. I'm going to introduce the first one, which, um, you know, as some of you will remember, and some of you do remember this case very well, the grand jury, you know, wrote this incredible report, absolutely extraordinary report, which is available on f- online for free. And I would recommend to anyone to read it who hasn't it's tough read reading. it. It's tough reading. Um, but one of the really sad things about this Kermit Gosnell story and some of the her- most horrific things, um, one of the most horrific things was the fact that um, uh, he, you know, he, he killed babies born alive at every stage um, up until up until 40 weeks, basically. Um, we discovered that and the grand jury discovered that. This first piece you're going to hear me read is about some of those bigger babies that he and the wife dealt with on Sundays. Actually, before you play that tip, Anne, uh, tell people who Kermit Gosnell was and, and what he did. So Kermit Gosnell was a, a doctor who operated a clinic in 3801 Lancaster Avenue, Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, for many decades, 30 decades, three decades, I think it was in the yep. end. Um, and he 
was found by the police to be running a pill mill. He was selling drugs um, mm-hmm. and an undercover cop discovered him. But in the process of of under uh, of of dis- of investigating this drug situation, they discovered a very very horrific story that was being that ju- uh, an extraordinary story where this man actually was routinely delivering babies alive at every stage of pregnancy and um, cutting their necks with scissors. Yeah, and he did this w- for decades. Two women had died in the clinic: Karnamaya Monger and Samika Shaw. But they think hundreds, perhaps thousands, of babies were murdered uh, during his his reign and. The authorities knew knew what was going on, they, but there was a policy, and it was a policy inspired by a, rep- a pro-choice Republican governor, Tom Ridge, not to inspect abortion clinics, so he was allowed to murder with impunity. Uh, the grand jury felt he should have been charged with hundreds of murders, perhaps thousands, but in the end they charged him with seven. Uh, then the, the trial opened, this this massive trial that, that should have been front page story all across America. It was ignored by the mainstream media and was one of the first examples of social media shaming the corporate media into covering a story. So uh, let's hear that. Over the years, there were hundreds of snippings. Most of these acts cannot be prosecuted because Gosnell destroyed the files. And these were not even the worst cases. Gosnell made little effort to hide his illegal abortion practice. But there were some, the really big ones, that even he was afraid to perform in front of others. These abortions were scheduled for Sundays, a day when the clinic was closed and none of the regular employees were present. Only one person was allowed to assist with these special cases, Gosnell's wife. The files for these patients, who were not kept at the office, Gosnell took them home with him and disposed of them. We may never know the details of these cases. We do know, however, that during the rest of the week, Gosnell routinely aborted and killed babies in the sixth and seventh month of pregnancy. The Sunday babies must have been bigger still. Yeah. And it's and, and you, you you can hear my voice in that. I mean, it's really really hard, and I was very emotional reading that. Um, the second piece I want to bring is actually it's it's um, I I felt like I should balance this out by having something slightly happier. And the second piece is an extraordinary piece. Um, and I do get emotional reading this only because I am emotional, but in a happy way. Um, and it's it was the one good story that the grand jury yeah. got to hear, and they heard an awful lot of evidence. Let's listen to that, and I want to say something about it afterwards. Gosnell began an abortion on a 29-week pregnant woman and then refused to take the dilators out when the woman changed her mind. We learned of another illegal third trimester abortion only because the mother changed her mind. In 2004, a 27-year-old woman went to Gosnell, pregnant with her first child. She testified that she was surprised when Gosnell told her she was 21 weeks pregnant. On the first day of what was to be a two-day procedure, Gosnell inserted dilators into the woman's cervix. After Gosnell had finished inserting the laminaria, the woman asked him what happened to the babies after they were aborted. She testified that Gosnell told her they were burned. At home, thinking over how Gosnell disposed of the fetuses, the woman had a change of heart. She called her cousin, and the cousin called Gosnell to tell him that they wanted to take the laminaria out. Gosnell said that he could not do that once the procedure had started, and he did not want to return the $1,300 that the patient had already paid. The pregnant woman ended up going to the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania to have the laminaria removed. It was determined at the hospital that she was 29 weeks pregnant. A few days later, the 27-year-old delivered a premature baby girl. She was treated at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia and is today a healthy... Okay, I got a minute now. Um, A few days later, the 27-year-old delivered a premature baby girl. She was treated at the hospital and she was, she was treated at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia and is today a healthy kindergartner. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, apologies for not being able to pull off reading that without, without 
sort of breaking down. But I think the most the more amazing detail that isn't mentioned as I read that is that the grand jury sat for over a year. These were regular people, about 50 people, you know, you know, women re- were knitting. There were people from just ordinary people who had to listen to this appalling evidence mm-hmm. for month after month after month. And that particular story, the story we, we always called it, the one that got away, um, it really affected the grand jury to the extent that the grand jury applauded when that witness was finished testifying. Yeah. They just broke out into spontaneous applause. It was the first good thing they'd heard. And we spoke to the, the two assistant district attorneys, Joanne Pescatori and Christine Wexler, and in their memory of doing grand juries for many, many years and talking to other people who had do- done grand juries, they had never known of a grand jury who ever clapped. Um, yeah. So we're we're thinking about all of that, um, uh, particularly thinking, I think, I, I think one other thing to mention that I think is very important is that while it's all very horrific what Kermit Gosnell did, and it really is horrific, he d- delivered these babies alive and he killed them. And we've seen photographs and there's photographs online of exactly who these babies were, baby boy A, who's a more memorialized in his photograph is online. Maybe we'll show that photograph at the end of the podcast and you can choose not to watch the end well, of the I think podcast I can go to, no, I think if you want. Or you can go, yeah, or you can go um, to what website? Site, babybyboya.com. Is that, uh, well, I gosnellmovie.com. No Actually, go, it's better. I think to give people the choice to see the, okay. the picture. But um, but I think the thing to mention that's really worth mentioning in the context of the Supreme Court decision that's coming up in, in June is the fact that in America, and I always want to tell people this because people need to know this. In America, it is legal, completely legal, mm-hmm. to kill to abort babies through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason. And uh, in about and it, 10 or 11 in, in, states. Yeah, not everywhere, not geographically everywhere, but in America. So you can drive somewhere and you can do that in America. Kansas, and, uh, and New Mexico, California, New York, um, uh, Colorado. Yeah, there's quite a number of states. Yeah, I think you've got most of them there. Yeah. Um, but also the other thing to mention in that context is the fact that those laws, those kind of abortion laws do not exist in Europe, by the way. In progressive Europe, they don't even do that. But they do do it in North Korea, in China, um, and unfortunately in Canada. Canada. Okay, Phil, and we went to the theatre. Tell us we about did. that. Yes. Yeah, we went to the theatre. I, well, I mean, look, I mean, just about going to the theatre. This is a different theatre, but this is about the kind of barriers that you have to face if you want to go to the theatre in certain parts of Los Angeles. Um, you know, the mass mandate, it's gone apparently, but... Uh, this is for the Kirk Douglas Theatre, the Centre Theatre Group. Um, Correct. Yeah. yeah, so... An important update regarding our mask policy. For the time being, we will continue to require masks, along with proof of vaccination and booster at all of our venues. This is consistent with the commitments we've made. This time, blah, blah, blah. You know, please note that, um, that, you know, so booster shots are required for anyone who is eligible. Per the guidelines... Full vaccination means that at least 14 days uh, have passed. Since receiving the final dose of the of the vaccine. Yeah. So so there is no waiting period. There's no waiting period. So you, you have to have a booster and you have to have had it 14 days previous. If you haven't had a booster, I think you can get a, a PCR test, but you have to go out and pay for it. $150. $150. And they won't accept a home test. And these are the same people. It's just like what you were saying earlier, Anne. The, you know, we, we love, we, 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 we care about minorities. And well, the, most the arts, vaccines... Yeah, the most, arts are for, the, are for minorities. Yeah, and yeah. the under, under, undercovered uh, under communities, underrepresented communities, and we need to go out into these communities. And it's like the people who are most vaccine skeptic are minorities. The people who can least afford tickets to the theatre are minorities. The people who can least afford to pay $150 for a test three days before you go to the theatre are minorities. So you're really making sure that the theatre is perfect for elite liberals. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the play we went to see is further proof of that. It's called Power of Sale. That's P-O-W-E-R of Sale, S-A-I-L. And it stars Brian Cranston and Amy... Oh, Amy Bremer. Amy 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 Bremer? Brennan Brennan Man, who uh, you may know from... Judging Amy, the TV series, and of course Brian Cranston from Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad. It's called. It's a. We went to see it really because it's. It built itself as a as a uh, as a free play speech. about free speech, you know. And you know, never a free speech at a university. Never was there a more promising play or even a more promising concept of mm-hmm. a play. Yeah. You know, but and you know about free speech and and then they did an interview with the playwright, which I'm trying to find now. Yeah, and the playwright is Paul Grelong, and uh, you know. 
the headline on, the, if you can see it there, there's the playbill, is dis disrupting the narrative. No, distorting the narrative. And, you know, unfortunately, it does anything but distort the narrative, <laughs> actually. I mean, it, it starts off promisingly, right? It's, a, you know, the, 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 this professor at Harvard has invited, you know, a, a neo-Nazi to speak as part of a, a, a panel and this protests and he's fighting for free speech and he's fighting for spe free speech and the dean is trying to, who's his friend, is trying to convince him and a couple of students are trying to convince him one's forward, one's against it, one's Jewish, one's not. And, you know, and there's all these different uh, ideas about the concept of free speech and they argue about it. And, you know, there are some good pro free speech arguments, but ultimately everyone kind of is, the anti-free speech argument kind of wins, but still the arguments are out there, it is, there is that open free flow of ideas. But as the play goes on, and this is that's called, it's called the power of sale, as the play goes on, there are, uh, every character is shown to be corrupt, mm -hmm. to have bad motives, to be a bad actor, to be self-interest, to claim that they want free speech, but be actually self-interested in something else, to claim they want to deplatform, to be anti-free speech for the right reasons. But again, they have bad motives. And it's a nice twist. You think everyone's pure, and then you realize everyone's impure, which is a great narrative for a play, actually, that challenges what you think about everything. Except there's one character who is a black professor who, in the middle of it, is the only professor, is the only person in the whole play who is the good, honest person. I'm going, that is not distorting the narrative. That is just pushing the same old narrative. Uh, I mean, it was, do you remember that movie, uh, Total Recall? Uh, was in the eighties. I mean, they cast a black taxi driver in that as the bad, as one of the bad guys, because at that stage they were so tired of movies that had black people in them that were angelic people. So this idea of the angelic black person who is the pure person in 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 the narrative uh, is is it was a cliche back in the eighties. Even and, then, and now we have this distorting the narrative play that goes back to it, and it really it it was disappointing in the end because. It, it, we watch Succession, uh, the TV series Succession. No one is any good in it. Everyone is bad, and therefore it 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 because you're sympathetic with them, uh, to them, and then you realize they're bad, and then you're sympathetic to them, and you realize you know it's just it keeps messing with your emotions. This does not have the courage of its convictions. Uh, the the sailing metaphor didn't work either. By the way, I felt um, <laughs> throughout it all the set was wonderful. The, the acting was, the acting was amazing. amazing, but ultimately the the playwright did not have, have the, the courage. courage. Yeah, he didn't have the courage to tell the real story, to yeah. tell the proper story, to care story. about the drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he sacrificed the drama for the narrative, just for a narrative and yeah. for a political narrative rather than narrative narrative, yes. as in classical. Yeah. Yes, so sorry. You know, when we say he yeah. sacrificed it for the narrative, if only he did, it would have been a better play. Um, and sacrificing narrative. There's a kind of a maybe a kind of a good segue. Nice so segue. One, in, you know, we we used to do this feature quite often here, doing crazy California stories. This is kind of a crazy California story, but I almost feel like using the phrase "crazy California" is unfair to this story because yes. this is such a Sad bloody story. awful story, really awful story. But I'll read what the New York, what the LA Times said, and I just think it's just. I mean, some of you have heard this story. Last week. A horrific shooting took place at a Sacramento area church. A 39-year-old man killed his three children and a person assigned by the court to supervise his visits with the kids. You know, and uh, anyway, since the tragedy, details about the man behind the massacre have emerged. Only a week before the killing... This is directly from the LA Times and, you know, listen to this. Only a week before the killings, David Mora, who took his own life after the attack, assaulted a California highway patrol officer after driving drunk and crashing his car in a muddy field. After that incident, he remained so combative that he was also booked for assaulting an emergency room technician at a hospital. Some 11 months earlier, Mora had been placed on a psychiatric hold by a Sacramento County authorities after he became aggressive and threatened to end his life. Here's what the LA Times follows that paragraph up with. They say, there remains one big question about the case. And now, that question is? And according to the LA Times, that question is, how did Mora get a weapon used in the shooting? That's not my question. And here's another thing that they'd missed in the first well, paragraph. No, no, let's talk about this question let's first. Work, yeah. So, so the question, my, uh, the obvious question is... How the hell was he uh, out in the streets? Yes, and he, how the he hell assaulted, he listen, he assaulted a California Highway Patrol officer after driving drunk and crashing his car. After that, he also assaulted an emergency room technician. Sorry, guys, 
What it's, are you doing out and you about? Be, why are you on bail? This is a, these are serious yeah, offences. Yeah. So the, you know, there are one, remains one big question for any sane person reading this article. They would, fu- they, in their own mind, they're going to answer that question with, "What the hell was he doing on the street?" Right? But in case said of that. The LA Times, then the LA Times, I won't read it to you, it goes on and on and on and on about um, uh, gun laws in California. However, buried nowhere in this story, uh, how do you like that film? Yeah. Buried nowhere in this story is what the New York Post brought to the story. The gunman who killed his three daughters, God love them, and another man in a church in Northern California was in the US illegally. And had not been handed over. I love this. Are you ready? Yeah. Did you know this film? And had not been handed over to ICE after a prior <laughs> arrest due to California's sanctuary state. So, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement authorities had been looking for this guy, and they wanted him to be detained. Well, well, and he was arrested. Uh- but he wasn't detained because we are a sanctuary state and they don't hand people over to ICE. And he was freed and he went on to kill uh, his three kids and another man because of our virtue signaling that you cannot hand violent criminals over to the immigration authorities to be detained. And by the way, he was being kept... Well, that's not be a serious question that everyone's asking. Oh, yeah. And by the way, he was the church was, was, was housing him, by the way. And I just think, and I don't know the identity of the man who died, um, who was the, the one who was supervising, but it was somebody from the church. Yeah. So it was one of these elders of that church who volunteered, look, I'll supervise the three children, the three darling yeah. girls, and I'll supervise them when this guy comes. And that fabulous hero and Christian man lost his life and the three darlings lost their lives because of these bail laws in in California and because of the laws. sanctuary city laws and because you know because it's now apparently it's a bad idea to lock really bad guys up I mean if you didn't you know you know there remains one question there remains only one question actually LA Times there's only one question here what is wrong with California that we don't recognize that this guy is dangerous this guy should not have any access to these three children and this guy needs to be locked up and then this guy needs to be deported because we have to have lo- Phelan and I are here we you know we 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 did the whole we do the whole visa process we've done all that all that stuff and it's a process and you do it and you you come here legally because it's a privilege to get to work here but you know but if you don't want to do that and if you don't want to follow those laws go back to wherever you came from see how you like that but this is terrible these tri- these three children are dead unnecessarily in this crazy California. Um, and I know that the governor's elections are coming up, right, Phelan? And, you know, hopefully, you know, we're going to see well, some I mean, changes it's, there. It's, it's, look, there, there, there are rules that when someone's arrested like that, they're, they're supposed to be, ICE or the immigration authority are supposed to be informed, and then they can decide whether to detain them or not, by the way. Um, they would have. Uh, but no, California has this thing where they will not cooperate with I mean, actually, it shouldn't even have been an immigration matter. The, the guy should have been in a jail, not getting any bail. Can I just give you another tiny piece from the LA Times story? Because it's just, you, you, you know, this is the, the newspaper. And by the way, there's the, two, the three children's names. Samia Mora Gutierrez, 13. Samantha Mora Gutierrez, 11. And Samara Mora Gutierrez, 9. But um, anyway, I wanted to read this other piece to you, but I just thought we'd mention the little darlings and the chaperone, Nathaniel Kong, 59 years old, you know, a member of the church. As part of the... So here's an interesting thing that I also thought we should bring to your attention. As part of the order, you know, whatever, Mora was... Mora was the the guy, the man who murdered the children and and the lovely person from the church. Mora was required to attest that he did not... Here's how it works, yeah? He was meant... he He was required to say he didn't possess any guns. But as is normal... Police were not directed to ensure his statement was truthful. Now, that's only in California, of course. Restraining order, gun restrictions, are an honours system. Are you kidding me? So, do you see what I'm reading there, well, Yeah, yeah. But so basically, you know, these, these <coughs> gun restrictions, they're basically to say, look, we have all these... It's, it's virtue signaling, actually. It's Because it, they're not serious about them. I mean, and by the way, uh, the, the DA in Los Angeles, he has reduced... The, the jail time you get for possession of illegal firearms. So they're not really serious about taking guns off people. If it's an honor system where you have to declare you don't have a gun and where you don't get serious jail time for possessing illegal guns, it's it's kind of virtue signaling saying to liberal elites saying, look, 
We are we are really nice people and we oh, care. Yeah. Anyway. But Faith Whitmore, who's the chief executive of the Sacramento Regional Family Justice Centre, uh, has mm. previously... <laughs> well, hang on a minute. Hang on. Here's what she... No, listen, Phil. Here's no, what she says. No, but hold on a moment. Hold on a moment. She, you know... Previously, Sorry. yeah, previous. She's, she's saying we rely on the perpetrator of Film, violent acts but to be read truthful. But the end, Film, Yeah, we, we re- here's what she said: we rely on the perpetrator of violent acts to be truthful and not possess weapons. There is no follow up, no check by law enforcement. That is something that needs to change. No, that is not something that needs to change. That, that, that you know, this person shouldn't have been on the street. It shouldn't. Yes, we shouldn't have true. been. You know, that's what needs to change. That's what needs to change. And, 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 and you know, this this is the, the early times focusing all these paragraphs on obscure uh, gun laws the guy shouldn't have been on the street having access to any guns and faith whitmore if you still are focused on whether this guy could got access to a gun or not or how how i mean or anything like that you are no you are not interested in family you are not inter- just interested in justice you are not a regional family justice center you are a virtue signaler because the thing that needs to change is that someone who assaults a california highway patrol officer someone who's drink driving someone who assaults an emt someone who has uh, had a psychiatric hold nine months before that should not be on the streets yeah. uh, with bail yeah, and right. should not be That's getting the thing that and needs should to not change. be getting and, access to their children. And someone actually. who uh, someone who uh, the immigration department need to get in touch with. They they need to be alerted to this person. So let's get on to something nice, Sam. Sorry, yeah, St. Patrick's Day. So it's St. Patrick's Day this week, as you all know, and of course we've worn our green. There we are. If you're Irish, come into the parlor. There's a welcome there for you. And if your name is O'Flaherty or Pat. So long as long as, as you're you come from, from Ireland, Ireland, there's a welcome, welcome on the mat. mat. So, uh, just to say, it's obviously, yes, St. Patrick's Day, I'm off the drink for Lent. That's the third time I think I've mentioned that in this podcast. Not that I'm nervous about it or anything at all. It's very good for the soul, apparently. You, what you need to do is make a really nice big pot of coffee the way you like your coffee. And what you want to then do is you need to get a nice glass, a nice get a nice glass, but put a spoon inside the glass like a teaspoon inside the glass because you're going to be putting in very hot liquid into that so start though with your whiskey at the bottom of the glass now the whiskey should not be a high grade whiskey so it should not be black bush this boy here heaven for which fans. is very nice to sip on and it shouldn't even be this boy which is another grand one and by the way this is a more sophisticated version of this but what we would oh. recommend i think so no these are two completely different whiskeys no right? i know they that they're two different. i know they're two different uh, whiskeys uh, so but they're uh, both good yeah the, the, the equivalent the, the equivalent of jameson is bush this is black bush this is a, a high grade a high grade high, further up further up it's above anyway uh, so anyway go ahead so you should so basically so you, you want to get a regular irish whiskey like yes. a paddy or something like yeah, that something cheap something cheap, cheap and cheerful and by the way good enough to have a bottle of paddy in the house anyway a paddy whiskey cuz in the winter if you've got the cold or whatever, you could just have I a lovely, it. you could have a lovely hot whiskey, lovely thing to do, by the way, which I never talked about on this podcast before. And I quickly mentioned to those of you who are still experiencing cold, cut a lemon, put some cloves into the lemon. This is how they do it in Ireland. Throw that into a glass and pour in again a shot of whiskey and then boiling water over that uh, again with a spoon in the, in the glass. So here what you're going to do is... That's the hot whiskey. That's now the hot now whiskey. we're on to the, the Irish, Irish whiskey. coffee. So the Irish I- sorry, what did I just say? Irish the Irish whiskey. coffee. Yeah. So the Irish coffee, you put your shot of whiskey in there at the bottom again, a not, not too expensive one. Nice big... Oh, delightful. <laughs> Delicious. Delicious. Okay, that goes there. Put a spoon in the glass so the glass doesn't shatter. A nice, you know, one of those sturdy glasses. Then pour in your favourite brew of coffee on top of that. And then what you want to do is you want to whip cream. Um, you can use a machine or whatever like that, but you've got to watch it like a hawk. You do not want it stiff and sitting in, pa- in peaks. You don't want that kind of cream. You want the cream to be pouring, but not pouring, pouring, pouring if that's a very technical way of describing Mm. it. You want it to pour like super slowly, but be still in the pouring stage. And what you want to do then, and I learned this from my mother, God rest her soul, is that you put the spoon, the back of the spoon, over the glass and just Mm. let that cream quietly, quietly come to the top of the glass. And then what will happen is you'll have a lovely head of cream at the top of the glass and it'll look like a Guinness. And you know what? It's a lovely drink, actually. How How do you make the whipped cream? Hi, that's very funny. That's a little private joke for Phelan and a friend of ours who we joke about who cannot cook and we always joke about how to whip cream. So it's um, next next week, by the way, it's going to be two years and one week since the two weeks to flatten the curve lockdown. Please, uh, we are 
I think it's fair to say the film is coming very, very close to completion. About six, seven weeks away from that. But uh, we will be updating you on on that. With and, and and there, I would say you're we're gonna you're gonna get to see some footage quite soon. Actually, quite soon. it's looking great. Um, but there are a number of processes that have to happen. You know, there's a, it, it's a, it's a process making a movie. You shoot the movie. You know, then it's edited. Then there's color correction. Then there's the music has to be and composed. The and the sound. It's a it's a big process. Then you have to find the footage. And there's all kinds of stuff has to be done. So, uh, and if you'd like to continue to help us, please do. We are going to need your help a lot to get this movie out to the vast world of people who, are, who, don't, conspiracy. No, who don't know this story, who don't yep. know about Hunter Biden and don't know about the Biden corruption. So please, if you can, go to mysonhunter.com, mysonhunter.com and give what you can. We are, uh, we are, we need your help. We need your help very badly to get this film out. So um, please do help. And those of you who have helped already, thank you very much. And go ahead and help again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.